Good morning. Good morning. Good mo oh, hold on. Testing. Oh, there we go. That was my fault. Good morning. My name is Chris. I'm the pastor, and I want to welcome you here to First UMC of Hammond to worship. Yes, we are still uh, not meeting in person. We are virtual worshiping right now, but uh, however you're joining us this morning, we are so glad that you uh, were able to join us. Uh, if you do me a favor, if you would uh, go to HammondFUMC.org and there click the digital registration uh, card and fill that out. That helps us uh, know who joined us today. And if you don't already receive our weekly worship email, if you fill out the digital registration card, you can get on that list and receive a lot of other great information as well. That is at HammondFUMC.org, uh, our digital registration card. Also at HammondFUMC.org, uh, you can give to support the ministry here uh, by following the donate button to the Tidely platform uh, and following the instructions to give electronically there. Uh, we do still uh, receive gifts uh, the old-fashioned way, uh, but you can give electronically uh, on our website, HammondFUMC.org. Dot org. Uh, and with that weekly worship email, you do get a digital version of the bulletin, which you may or may not have in front of you. But uh, I won't go uh, in detail right at this moment, uh, but just remind, uh, remind you that the February, uh, the February second mile giving is the Sojourner Truth House. And uh, we ask that you give generously to that. Um, and uh, not much on the schedule, but uh, I will let you look through the rest of those details. Uh, again, all, uh, all that and more can be found at our website, HammondFUMC.org. With that, we will begin our time of worship, and we do that as we do each week by joining together in our call and response. It's brief two lines that we repeat three times where I say, O oh Lord, open our lips, and you respond, and we shall declare your praise. Are you ready? O oh Lord, open our lips. And we shall declare your praise. O oh Lord, open our lips. And we shall declare your praise. O oh Lord, open our lips. And we shall declare your praise. Now let me invite you to join me as we sing our opening hymn, Cornerstone.
Now, if we can just take a moment and bow our heads in opening prayer. God of truth, we come longing for the peace that only you can provide. We seem so often to be tossed to and fro, blown about by every wind except that of your own Holy Spirit. Be pleased to dwell here this day, to receive our worship and our praise. Linger long and speak the truth to us in love, that we may come to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the full stature of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Terry. Let me invite Pat to come up and share the children's message this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Happy Super Bowl Sunday and happy day before Valentine's Day. Well, this morning, Emma wants to share her story. And she, I titled it, Be My Valentine. Her friends, she and her friends realized that Valentine's Day was quickly approaching. In fact, Valentine's Day is tomorrow. I hope you all are prepared. So she and her friends were sitting around talking and they were talking about all the things that they love. And um, this is kind of the, the part of the message where if we were all together at church, I would ask the kids to list off the things that they love. So I'm gonna ballpark it. I'm gonna guess at what they might say. They may say, oh, I love pizza or chocolate. Well, if Cheryl Selgin was here, she'd say chocolate. Chocolate. Um, they, video games, absolutely. Um, homework probably would not appear on that list. So, but she thought, she says, there's gotta be a little bit more to this love thing than just those basic things. So my idea this morning was that together, we're going to bake a cake. This is gonna be fun. And I packaged up in my little bag all of the nice ingredients. Mm. I got my little plastic bowl. Let me take that out. And to make my cake, let's see what I have. I have some ketchup. Ooh, yum. I've got um, mild banana peppers. Ugh and I've got some sweet pickle relish. So I'm, I'm not gonna make a mess up here on Pastor Chris's wonderful, beautiful pulpit, but if I mixed all of these things together, you know what I've got? I've got a big mess. I've got one heck of a big mess because in order to make a good cake, you've got to have the right ingredients. 
And so you might ask yourself, what does this have to do with a message on love? Well, in order to show love, it's always important to start with the right ingredients. And the Bible says that love is patient and kind, and that love starts with God. In fact, God loved us so much that he sent his only son, Jesus, to be here with us. And what did Jesus do? Jesus traveled around preaching and healing and showing love to even the most unlikely of people. So why would God expect us to do anything less? So my challenge to you this week is to kind of dip into some of those ingredients and come up with a plan to show God your family, your friends love, but most importantly, God wants us to love those people who sometimes aren't the nicest people in the world. We need to love everybody. Remember, love is patient and love is kind. God wants us to love one another as he has loved us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to remember that love is not about what we can have for ourselves. Love is about what we can do for others. And most importantly, Lord, we thank you for the love you've shown to us and for your son, Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pat. As we continue on with worship, as we uh, continue on with our music, uh, just before we hit there, we will uh, soon approach our prayer time. If you're uh, joining us on Facebook or Zoom, we encourage you to use the comment section as we uh, uh, seek to be in prayer with you as we are uh, distant. So uh, let me invite you to continue worship with me as we sing hymn number 92 for the beauty of the earth. As we continue once again, as we continue on in our worship, I will invite you to use the comment section in uh, Zoom or Facebook to uh, be remain in prayer with us. Uh, uh, Sarah, are there any coming through that we can share? 
uh, while she's doing that, I'm going to share one from Sarah um, for uh, Vanessa Solis and family. Uh, Vanessa is meeting with a brain surgeon tomorrow to review and start treatment for rare bone cancer. Uh, we do a turn of family up in our prayers. Right, Susan. Susan is asking prayers for her seven-year-old grandson who has COVID. He was vaccinated um, and prays that the rest of the family so far is negative. We, oh, sorry. The prayer request that Chris just mentioned was for Vanessa Solis. She will be meeting with a brain surgeon tomorrow to discuss treatment for a rare brain um, bone cancer. And Sandra is asking prayers for her dad who is getting his foot amputated in the next week or so. And Sue is asking prayers for her nephew and family whose wife passed away last night. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, please continue to uh, uh, use the comment section as uh, we continue on uh, in our uh, worship service. But let me invite you in this time to quiet your minds and hearts and go with me before God in prayer. And as you hear the words, God of all mercy, I encourage you to respond. Hear our prayer. Let us pray. Lord of all creation, we know your heart aches for all who suffer. Sometimes it seems the only thing we can do is pray. Sometimes it seems all we can do is keep the suffering in our thoughts. Help us understand when and how we can be your agents of change. This morning our thoughts and prayers are with all of your children. For the children of God around the world who go to bed hungry, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God whose world is rocked by violence, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God who continue to rebuild their lives following natural disasters, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God who have no permanent shelter, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God who lack necessary health care, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God who struggle with demons, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God who await a diagnosis, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God who mourn the loss of loved ones, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God who face difficult decisions, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of God who feel they've lost their purpose, God of all mercy, hear our prayer. We give all these prayers and heartfelt thoughts to you, O God, knowing you have heard not only the concerns we have spoken, but the concerns in our hearts as well, and those known only to you. We pray all these in the name of Jesus the Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Luke 6, 
verses 17 to 26. Jesus' popularity increases. Jesus came down from the mountain with them and stood on a large area of level ground. A great company of his disciples and a huge crowd of people from all around Judea and Jerusalem and the area around Tyre and Sidon joined him there. They came to hear him and to be healed from their diseases. And those bothered by unclean spirits were healed. The whole crowd wanted to touch him because power was coming out of him and he was healing everyone. Happy people and doomed people. Jesus raised his eyes to his disciples and said, Happy are you who are poor because God's kingdom is yours. Happy are you who hunger now because you will be satisfied. Happy are you who weep now, because you will laugh. Happy are you when people hate you, reject you, insult you, and condemn your name as evil because of the human one. Rejoice when that happens. Leap for joy because you have a great reward in heaven. Their ancestors did the same things to the prophets. But how terrible for you who are rich, because you have already received your comfort. How terrible for you who have plenty now, because you will be hungry. How terrible for you who laugh now, because you will mourn and sleep and weep. How terrible for you when all speak well of you. Their ancestors did the same things to the false prophets. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pat, remind me. There we go. Pat, remind me to uh, talk to you about what cakes you're baking. <laughs> I'm a little concerned about that. Let us pray. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Have you ever walked into a convenience store and found that the line was unexpectedly long? Chances are pretty good that these people are not there because there's an instant run on bread or milk or overcooked hot dogs, they're interested more than likely in buying something far less tangible. It's a sequence of numbers embedded in a distant and very secure computer. When they finally reach the head of the line, they'll hand over a dollar or two or possibly a good deal more for a slip of paper with some of those numbers on it. Now they're buying lottery tickets, of course, if ever you find yourself in such a situation, take a glance at the lottery marquee displaying the size of that week's jackpot. And with lines like that, chances are the value is in the hundreds of millions of dollars. One jaw-droppingly big, it's only jaw-droppingly big numbers like that that bring out the long lines. And the problem with that is that mathematically speaking, the more people who buy tickets for any giving draw, given drawing, the more likely it is that there will be more than one winner splitting the jackpot two or more ways. The really huge number may not, for the lucky winners, prove to be as mind-boggling as they had hoped was advertised. But who said lottery tickets were about reality anyway? I mean, honestly, dollar for dollar, they are one of the worst investments one could possibly make. Lotteries are not about reality, but fantasy, the pipe dream of instant and undeserved wealth. Currently, there are 45 states in this country that operate lotteries. Each one is counting on a large number of residents to share in that fantasy right, of winning, striking it big. Now, it's likely that most of the people listening to this have not felt that 
particular feeling. Whether or not you've lined up to purchase a ticket or, or yourself, haven't you ever daydreamed about what it would be like to win something like $100 million? How different would life be? Oh, the things you could buy, the places you'd go. The reason that this is all so desirable to many of us is that most of us consider wealth to be a blessing, especially in this country. Now, the, pro the other problem for us is that Jesus doesn't tend to see it that way, especially in this week's gospel lesson where he says, blessed are you who are poor. And he teaches the crowd, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Then a little later, has choice words for the wealthy, right? Woe to you who are rich, for you have received consolation. Now, this is Luke's version of the Beatitudes, which might sound and definitely is different than the better known Matthew version. To begin with, it takes place in a different location. A location. I mean, it may be relative degrees at this point, but while Matthew's takes place on a mount, uh, Luke's takes place on a plain for whatever difference that is, for whatever worth that difference is. But the biggest difference when stacked up next to each other, Luke and Matthew, the difference is that Luke includes statements of woe along with the statements of those who are blessed. You see, not only is Jesus blessing certain people in Luke's version, but he's also cursing people. Jesus blesses the poor, the hungry, those who weep, and preaches woe to the rich, the satisfied, and even those who laugh. I mean, it's no wonder people prefer Matthew's version. It's a lot more bright and sunny, and, and people don't get their feelings hurt. Luke's raises troubling questions. Is it wrong to be rich? Is it a sin to be successful? And what's Jesus got against laughter? Seems kind of strange. Especially since one of my favorite pieces of art is one that I have in my office. It's a... a a replica of the laughing Christ, one of my favorite images, uh, Jesus laughing. But there it is, right there, Jesus has got something against people who laugh. This is one of those things that we can see Jesus hitting up against when we hear Jesus tell the rich young ruler, who by all accounts was a person of great faith, that the wealth that the rich young ruler carried is enough to weigh down their eternal prospects. Right? What does Jesus say? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a person of wealth to enter the kingdom. And while very often, especially in the 21st century American context of looking at this passage, we tend to slough it off because here in 21st century America, everyone is just a split second away from pulling themselves up by their own bootstraps and making their first million. And so we, we don't want to speak uh, ill of those people because we might be one of them one day. In a nation of people who believe and highly value the idea that at any moment they can pull themselves up by their bootstraps, we need to pay attention to this maybe a little bit more. Will it change dramatically or pragmatically what it is we, how it is we operate in life? No, but gosh, if we shouldn't take a look at it because it's something that we, 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 we need to wrestle with. Right? With these admonitions against the, the, those who laugh and the wealthy. A cynic may criticize Jesus for playing to the crowd, right? Populism is very popular right now. All you got to do is say a couple of sentences uh, against some sort of institution, and any crowd you're speaking, against, uh, speaking to is going to uproariously applaud anything that you say because the, a, a group of people speaking against another group of people tends to... Uh, elicit a positive, if angry, response in some sections. Right? If this gathering of common folk, of the poor or nearly poor, if this gathering of common poor, you know, if they can't, hold on, I'm getting lost here. 
Jesus is doing more, though, than simply telling the mob what they want to hear. And he's, he's imparting a great truth, and it has to do with the nature of blessings, the nature of what it is he's speaking about, not just... Uh, uh, anyway. In times of trouble, a well-meaning friend may counsel us something to the effect of just count your blessings. Or the much more popular, look on the bright side, right? Uh, concentrate on the good things in life. We often criticize folks who are always looking at the negative. Well, maybe their life is just always full of negative, and maybe we need to honor that in them. Concentrate on the good things. Look away from the bad. If we don't see it, it's not there, and we don't have to pay attention to it. The world is always eager to count blessings, though some might call it keeping score. How blessed are they? They've got the, the big giant house. I took a history course at Ball State University all about the history of rich business owners in America. I mean, that was part of the curriculum. We value that idea. How blessed are they with the big house and the big business and all the cars filling the huge garage, all the high-tech gadgets to play with? And if it's not the tangible things, it's the intangible. What a good-looking bunch that is, as if what the person or family group of people looks like tells you what's in their heart. Even those who have little in the way of material goods are quick to count in some very conspicuous ways what blessings they do have. How else to explain exorbitant prices charged for things like uh, basketball shoes? Right? One person's Air Jordans might be another's Mercedes Benz. Counting blessings is really what lottery players are doing, only they're counting blessings, they're counting blessings before they hatch. The world has its own set of beatitudes in contrast to Jesus' list. Blessed are the rich, the famous, who have big houses on the beach. Blessed are those with perfect children who move and shake and even move the movers and shakers. People with their picture on the cover of People magazine. Blessed are those who want it and take it. Luke tells us Jesus has no time for any of that. And as the people of Jesus, we should look into whether or not we have time for it. In the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus turns the world's values upside down as Jesus is wont to do for anyone who has read the Synoptic Gospels. He blesses those whom the world calls cursed, and he preaches woe upon those who the world admires. Again, revolutionary stuff for the time, but necessary stuff. Jesus' words may pinch at times. In our deepest moments of clarity and insight, we realize he's right. At some point, we realize that he's right, or we will. Money can't buy happiness, as the old proverb contends. Good health can't buy happiness either. All of us know people who have, ever spent, uh, who have never spent a day in the hospital, yet who seem not to enjoy an ounce of life. Harmonious family life, a meaningful job, creature comforts, and leisure time to pursue hobbies do not guarantee happiness either. You can have them all. You can have it all and still feel empty inside. When Luke reports Jesus saying, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your cons consolation, it's a very unusual Greek word that he uses for consolation. It's a commercial term that means literally having received what is due. Your consolation is having you having received what you are due. It's the rubber stamp at the bottom of an invoice that says paid in full. The self-satisfied high rollers, in other words, have been paid in full. They've been given much in this life, but they won't receive a penny more. That's what it says in our scripture. Are we going to believe it? 
There's an old parable from the Jewish tradition describing a wealthy farmer who was visited by the prophet Elijah, for those who don't know. In Judaism, Elijah is something of the Holy Spirit-ish. That's not exactly, it's not a perfect replica, but that's to give you an idea. You can drop in and visit any time, which is why at the Seder meal, a place is set for Elijah. On this visit, Elijah is accompanied by a young rabbi who wants to observe how the prophet meets out divine justice. The two arrive at the farm disguised as poor and weary travelers. The farmer banishes them to the barn with only bread and water for supper. He has no time for visitors, he gruffly explains. He has to dig a well the next day. After a cold and sleepless night, Elijah arises before dawn, goes out from the barn, and digs the farmer's well. Why did you do that? His young protege asked him later. Our host was cruel and heartless, neglected the sacred laws of hospitality, but you have blessed him by digging his well. It's true that I've dug his well, Elijah admits. And the place where I have dug it will yield sweet water for many generations. What you don't know is that this farmer was planning to dig a well in another place. A few feet below the ground in that location lied a sweet treasure. Because I've dug his well, rather than he, that treasure will go undiscovered for a hundred years, long after our host has gone to his grave. What seems like a blessing is not always a blessing. It seems kind of harsh, but it gives us an idea of what we're talking about. We all often gloss over those ideas in Scripture that we are uncomfortable with personally. How do we grapple with that? The rich farmer has received his consolation. The debt owed him has been paid in full and then some. But now that it's been paid, that's it. Beyond his present wealth, there's no more future uh, promise of future blessing. It's kind of like that classic TV beer commercial. Stay with me for our teetotaling Methodist folks. The one with the group of men sitting around a campfire doing the male bonding thing. Their canoes pulled up onto the beach, tents pitched, dinner cooking, and there's a gorgeous sunset on the horizon. It doesn't get any better than this, one of them contentedly says before cracking open his beer. How sad. I mean, sure, that's got to be nice. It's good where they are. Very good, in fact. There's food and fire and companionship and, yes, even cold beer. Yet, if, true, if it truly doesn't get any better than that, if there's nothing more to life than a tasty meal, a fleeting sunset, and a few cold ones consumed in good company, well, woe to them, for they have received their consolation. Oscar Wilde once quipped, in this world there are only two tragedies. One is not getting what one wants, the other is getting it. The wonder of God's power to bless is that it happens regardless of our circumstances. It was Helen Keller, the blind and deaf mute, who triumphed over her, her disabilities, who wisely pointed this out. Although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. God's way of blessing us sometimes is to remove the cause, is not to remove the cause of our complaint, but to give us power to prevail over it. It's the remark of the philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's the wounded oyster that mends its shell with the pearl. Who's to say what's a blessing and what's a curse when it really comes down to it? From our human perspective, what looks like the greatest of calamities may, in God's eye view, really be our salvation. There's an old story, a true one, about a man who had a hard life. When he was seven years old, his family was evicted from their home. When he was nine, his mother died. 
At 22, he lost his job as a store clerk. He'd always wanted to go to law school, but his education wasn't quite good enough. He went into business instead and at age 23 became a partner in a small store. Three years later, his partner died leaving huge debt that took him years to repay. At 28, he asked the woman he'd been courting for years to marry him, to which she said, no. For a moment, his luck seemed to change. At age 37, he was elected to Congress on his first try, but then two years later was voted out. At 41, his four-year-old son died. At 45, he ran for the Senate and lost. At 47, he failed as a vice presidential candidate. At age 49, ran for the Senate again and lost. Back then, you were only out $5, not $5 million when you run a failed Senate candidate, but campaign, but I digress. Then at age 51, that same man was elected president of the United States. His name was Abraham Lincoln, and once again, now you know the rest of the story. Now, his name was Abraham Lincoln, right? And according to that story, you would think that some people get all the breaks, right? It, it, it really doesn't do us much good to count our blessings, nor does it help to count our misfortunes either. The Bible promises in Romans 8, all things work together for good for those that love God. Somehow we've got to learn to trust that word as hard as it may be to do it at times. When Jesus says, blessed are the poor, the hungry, and those who weep, he's bearing witness to the truth that God is in charge of creation and that God isn't finished with us just yet. God will inevitably bless us if we have faith God may bless us someday with what we most desire, or perhaps, more likely, God may bless us through what we desire but don't receive. It's not counting our blessings that's important. It's the blessing itself that counts, God's blessing. And that blessing, that blessing sojourning with us through wealth and poverty, health and sickness, laughter and tears... Praise to God for knowing us better than we know ourselves and for blessing us in every circumstance. Amen. Now let me invite you to sing a hymn of response with me, number three, uh, 467, Trust and Obey.
Once more, before we get to our closing hymn, I will remind you that if you would like to uh, support the ministry of First UMC of Hammond, uh, uh, you may do so right now by going to our website, hammondfumc.org, following the donate button to the Tithely platform and following the instructions there. You may also give through the traditional ways, uh, but uh, uh, we uh, I thank you very much for your support of the ministry here at First UMC of Hammond. Now let me invite you once again as we sing our closing hymn, number 364, Because He Lives. so much for joining me this morning. As you leave this place today, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you all and give you peace. Amen.